All right, good evening, everybody. Good to see everyone here tonight. I know there's still some people maybe trickling in. Um, as we get started, I want to invite Megan uh, to come on up, middle school director, to give you guys a quick announcement. All right, what's up, guys? Usually when someone says what's up, usually there's a response afterwards. So let's try that one more time. What's up, guys? There we go. <laughs> we'll try again. All right, guys, so if you notice on your tables, there is a little brochure pamphlet thingamajig. That is for our upcoming event this Sunday, all right? So we're going to be meeting here in the back parking lot from 4 to 6, all right? 4 to 6 to on Sunday here, all right? So I hope to see you all there. We're going to play some awesome games. You will be a lot of the pieces, so think of your, like, favorite board game and, like, ginormous size it. So, can't wait to see you guys there, all right? Thanks, man. How many bruises did you get? <laughs> all right, so, um, I'll give you a rundown of what we're going to do tonight. Uh, also, greetings to those that are watching online, and, uh, but let's begin first with a word of prayer. Could you bow your heads? Let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for this day, uh, an opportunity to come together and study your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would continue to shape and mold us, uh, Lord, as we, uh, as we seek you in everything that we do. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, Ada, find a seat somewhere where there's not three people. So we'll have three max at a table for now. And uh, so, guys, here's the plan. Every uh, Monday night, I want to start on time, and I'll finish on time. That way you guys can kind of count on that, bank on that. So we'll be done at 8 o'clock uh, tonight. So um, for right now, what you really are going to need to bring with you uh, on, on any given Monday night is your workbook. I see most of you have that. Um, if anybody doesn't have one right now, you can jump upstairs. Everybody have one? Because they're still up on the table upstairs, still a few that are outstanding, but I think most of you guys have got them. Um, we won't be needing your um, catechism tonight, so that's okay. Uh, you got Bibles on the table, you can certainly make use of those. You do need something to write with, pencil or a pen, uh, so have that handy. And, uh, and I'm going to encourage you to mark up some things in your workbook, uh, because you never know when I'm going to uh, do a quick check to see if you uh, have learned anything or recalled anything. You'd be able to use your workbooks for that. So uh, open up to the first page uh, as we look through this workbook. We're going to be diving in to the basics of the Bible this year. So we're going to be together for the, the duration of the school year. Uh, I know it seems like it's been kind of a weird school year already. Um, I got a camera standing here. You guys are probably getting used to seeing cameras uh, in classes, whether you're Zooming classes or things like that. Uh, it is just the world that we live in right now. But I'm glad to be together uh, here in this room uh, and also glad that people are tuning in uh, online at home if they need to do that. I want you to think for a second. Um, what is the last? Well, let's ask this way. Um, what's a favorite book that you've read within the last couple of years? The favorite book that you've read in the last couple of years? Does it have to be about religion? No, be a book about anything. Yeah. Favorite book or a good book that you've read in the last couple of years? Anybody? Jace? It's called Restart. Restart? Okay, what was it about? Huh, totally changed, right? Reset. I like that. Cool. Who had a book over here? Did I see a hand go up? Abby? Okay, what was that about? Oh, cool. Yeah, all right. Very good. Very good. Other favorite books? Ava? Flawed? What's that about? But you got something out of it. Okay, Eddie? I've heard The Man Who Loved Clowns? Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Micah? 
The Outsiders. Yeah, they made a movie about that. Yeah, tell everybody what the book's about. It's about Greaser. Yeah, yeah. Tell them what. Tell everybody what that is. So a Greaser is pretty much a blue collar, very rough. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right, The Outsiders. So you guys understand the reason I was asking that question about books, because whether you're a reader or not, we find certain books that we read so we understand how books work. And I don't mean that, that in a very complicated way. Books are pretty simple, right? We understand that books are made up of chapters. There's characters in them. We tend to follow them. Sometimes characters come back around that you read about early on and they come back later. And so if we're going to look at the Bible, I want you to understand that the Bible is made up of books. Even though we look at it and kind of go, it's got a cover on both ends, we think of it as one book. It's actually made up of several books. And we're going to kind of break that down a little bit uh, this evening and as we go through this. So I want you to think of a book in the Bible, right? Without looking in your Bibles, if you had them there, open it up. Let's just go around the room and see if you can name a different book in the Bible until we run out of ideas. Ada, give me a book in the Bible. Ecclesiastes. Good. Everybody's glad you got that one out of the way. So everybody remember them, all right, so that you don't say the same one again. Abby? Ephesians. Ephesians. Hannah? Psalms? Which one? Mark. Mark? Good. Exodus. Exodus. Genesis. 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 Leviticus. Leviticus. Numbers. Numbers. Oh, you guys are smart. Ava? Joshua. 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 Titus. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Connor? Matthew. Matt, with, with Matthew? Matthew, let's go around one more time. Ada? Um, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, very good. John, good. First Kings. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Copy Ben's. <laughs> Second Peter, very good. Judges. Judges. Philemon. Philemon. Revelation. Revelation, good one. Hey guy, there you go, very good. Amos, Amos very good. Micah? Micah. Micah, very good. Very good, I like that. All right, we could go on for a while. There's 66 of them, uh, but that's good. So you guys just kind of drawn those out a little bit. Which one is your favorite? If I were to ask you which is your favorite book of the Bible, which one is your favorite, Ava? I have two. Okay. Why Joshua? Uh, there you go. Very good. So you had some favorites out of there. Abby? Okay. Why John? John talks a lot about love. Right? And that's that's one of the great things about the Gospel of John. Micah? Marcus. Yeah? Because it's named after you? Yep, and 5-2. And 5-2. There you go. Good verse. So I want you guys to think about it. We tend to identify uh, with books for a reason. And so we're going to kind of flush out a little bit of Scripture as we go through in the next few weeks. Actually, several weeks as we go through this. So if you take a look at your first page there, page 5. If you're on page 5. Um, let's read through this a little bit. I'm going to ask you guys to read. Um, if you don't want to, if you really do not like to read uh, in class, I'll respect that. We'll move on. Uh, but I'm going to kind of call on you at times just to read some of these. Just read a paragraph. A paragraph is what I'm looking for. Trevor, would you start out with maybe you like books? Okay, so we talk about, so we may have mixed feelings about books, but the fact of the matter is, is there's full, full of information. Micah, next paragraph. There is no doubt that the book called the Holy Bible is the most important book in history, by far. It has been read, studied, debated, and fought more than any other book in history by a mind. What is in the Holy Bible has changed the course of human history and things that were written so what it's saying there is it truly is 
It truly is the most important book in history. And I'm not saying that just from a Christian standpoint that we think it's important, which we do, but it really is. Worldwide, there's been no other book that's been bought, that's been shared, that's been copied anywhere close to the Bible. In fact, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Right? It's, it, the Bible has been bought like a hundred times greater than the next book. Right? And, and so it's just never going to be anything that's going to be competed with that. And the thing is, is we keep copying it. We keep making more. Right? It's not that it's, we would do it and just fill the earth and so forth. Because they get consumed, they get worn out, and, and we keep making them and keep using them. Um, next one here. Ada, would you read the next paragraph? Very good. All right, so we're going to see how important it is. So I'm going to ask you to underline some things uh, in this little orange box, sort of. It says, before we get ahead of ourselves, however, let's get to what the Holy Bible is. So I'll underline this. The word Bible literally means book. So underline that for me, right there and there. Absolutely. Help yourself to a pen or a pencil. All I ask is make sure they get back there so we can use them every week. All right? So Bible, the Bible means book. We actually get it from the, word, from the Latin word Biblia, right? Biblia or actually the Greek as well, uh, which is not surprising. It's a big book, but it's so much more. We'll get to that on the next page. So what about the word holy, right? What about the word holy? What does that word mean? There's a little blank there, um, a space between that and the next paragraph. Give me some ideas of what you think holy means, Aiden. Very good. Set apart from God. Write that down. Set apart from God. Any other words that you think would be good to use for describing something that's holy? Set apart for God. That's great. What else? Any other words that you can think of? Maybe you've heard. You'd imagine, Jason? Maybe sinless. What? Sinless. Sinless. Good word. Yeah, sinless. Sinless, right? And the absence of sin. Other thoughts? Other things we might say that holy kind of embodies, right? I think in a, in a very simple way, it's special, right? That's another good word, special, okay? So, what makes the Bible so special? It's not special because it's an important book or it's just an important book. It's so special because, underline this, it's all about Jesus. Underline that for me. It's all about Jesus. It points to Jesus. It shows us who He is, uh, what He's done for us. And more than that, in the Scriptures, we have God's Word. And God uses the words and messages of this book to work faith and life in us. This is because of Jesus. Right? And so I want you to listen to these two passages. So, um, let's see. Eddie, would you read that first passage, John 5, 39? It's in italics there. All right, well done. So I want you guys in that verse, when you guys look at that verse, I want you to circle whatever jumps out at you. Right? What, what's some words or word that jumps out at you in that John 5, 39? Right? John 5, 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Now, me is capitalized. Who's that talking about, do you think? Jesus specifically, which is God, obviously, as well, all right? What do you think? What jumps out at you? Eternal life. Eternal life. Great words. That's so important, right? Anything else jump out at you guys? Okay. Scriptures. Scriptures, yeah. So you kind of say, the scriptures are significant. They're powerful. Any other words, phrases jumped out at you guys? Out of those? Ava? Bear witness. Bear witness, right? Something that we need to do. Right? To bear witness. Okay. Um, second passage. Connor, would you read Luke 24, 27 at the bottom? In the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interrupted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay. Again, find a word, a phrase, circle it, underline it, whatever you want that jumps out at you that means something significant. So, what jumped out at you? What do you guys think? Give me something jumped out. Micah? Interpreted. Interpreted. What do you think that means? Any thoughts? 
What's interpreted mean? It means you discover a meaning, right? You determine it, right? If, if somebody had to, I don't know if you have really bad handwriting, right? And somebody has to interpret it, which means they're like, I'm not too sure what that says. But if somebody knows your handwriting and kind of goes, oh no, that's an M, right? You're like, that doesn't look like an M, right? But somebody can interpret it because they're, they're familiar with it. Like for me, if I knew a, a foreign language, Right? And so I heard it. Like if you guys were in church or watched church online last Sunday, um, I had that, uh, that French phrase for RSVP. RSVP is répondez s'il vous plaît. means respond please. Okay? Now, that's, that's all the French I know right now. Okay? But you could interpret it. If you read that in French, you're like, I don't know what that is. But interpreting it says, here's how I can understand it. Other thoughts, phrases jump out at you? Anything? Okay? So the point is, is that I think that's what happens in Scripture a lot, and it should. When you read a, a part of Scripture, there should be things that kind of go, hey, that's important, or that, that means something to me. I think, Ava, if I could point you out, you said you like Joshua and Ecclesiastes because of two verses in there that you're like, those mean something to me. I like them. It was Joshua 1.9. It's one of my favorites, too, right? And so we think of how powerful the Word of God can be and how it excites us when we hear something that really registers. Turn the page. So let's talk about what's in the Bible, right? The Bible, as I said, is not just a book. It's actually a collection of books. Uh, so let's see. Hannah, would you read that first paragraph for me? Stop there. Underline that. 66 books. I want you to know that. Okay? Hannah, finish it up. Okay. Now, we actually know that in the Bible, I want you to write this in the margin a little bit, there's actually a little more than 40 authors. 40 authors. It's not written in your book, but I want you just to add that. So 40. It says there, many different authors. There's actually 40 plus now, the reason I'll tell you 40 plus, uh, for instance, you know, Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, um, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, um, David wrote many of the Psalms, Solomon wrote Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes, Joshua wrote Joshua, a lot of them have their own names. Some of you, uh, somebody mentioned Ephesians, right, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, all written by Paul. So we have authors to all these different books in the Bible, but there's a couple of books that we're not too sure who wrote them. Hebrews is one of them. If you ever heard of the book of Hebrews, we're not absolutely positive that it was Paul that wrote it. Now, that's not a problem for us, okay? It's not that we go, well, if it doesn't have an author, then maybe it's not that important. What we gauge is whether or not it actually talks about Jesus in the same way that all the other books do. Right? And, and it does, and so we kind of go, it doesn't quite write like Paul, but close to Paul, but it's included in the, in the Bible nonetheless. All right, um, so let's see. Will, would you read that second paragraph there? The Bible has two divisions, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't use the word Testament too much today. The Testament is the Old Testament All right, so um, think of some different contracts I'm looking for. Not contract, you're thinking of muscles. That's true. Spelled exactly the same way. But a contract is some written agreement. Okay? So guys, I want you to think about right now, and just shout them out, what are some contracts that you might be aware of right now? Or even though a covenant isn't something we talk about, it might be something that you have some familiarity with. Give me an example of a contract. Something you've heard of. Ada? Which would be, what was that about? Um, they, they decided to all, like, live in Plymouth, even though some of them really wanted to go to the South. There you go. So the early pilgrims, right, came and said it was going to be an agreement to live in a place. So they had, they had an agreement, a contract. Okay? Give me an example of another contract, Jace. If you, like, give a contract to a sports player. Yeah, very good. We talk about how much, you know, this guy's getting paid, whether he's first round draft pick or not. So he signs a contract, right? And make a whole lot of money, don't they? All right, Ben. Uh, the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta. Tell us what it is. Well 
done. Well done. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. And you sign a contract to buy a house called a mortgage, right? Sign a mortgage. Um, how about this? What's this? Does it have anything to do with the contract? Every cell phone has a contract. You have a certain service, right? That has, you know, here's what you pay and here's how long you have it and here's what it costs and so forth. So you and I are familiar with contracts and covenants. So when it says that there is an Old Testament and a New Testament, this has something to do with an arrangement, an agreement between two parties. So you've got God and us. And so there's a message in those Testaments. In fact, I'll tell you, it's the same message in both Testaments about a relationship between God and us. Anybody got an idea of what that message is? What do you think the message is from God to us that is consistent through the whole Bible? Old Testament, New Testament. What message do you think is consistent? Okay. Yeah, that God loves us. Because you think all the way back to Genesis 1 when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't say, I'm done, right? I'm just going to forget about you. I'm going to start over uh, or whatever. He says, I'm really sorry that this happened, essentially. And he says, but I'm going to fix this, right? I'm going to send one that's going to repair what is broken. Now, bad news is you can't stay in Eden anymore. You've got to leave the garden, right? And it's going to be hard out there. Right? You're going to have to work. Uh, things aren't going to grow the best out there in the, in the real world now that there's sin. And you're going to die. Right? Death now enters in. Before then, Adam and Eve were going to live forever. But now he says, now it's going to be tough. But the agreement was, I love you and I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix it. Right? And so the promise, right, the contract continues on throughout all of the Old Testament. Okay? In fact, the Old Testament, I've been um, interviewing sitting down and talking with our confirmands, the ninth graders. Uh, before they get confirmed, they sit down with me. Ava, your sister was just this last Sunday. Um, and I sat down with Savannah, and I sat and talked with her for about a half hour and uh, asked about what she believes, what she knows, uh, what she's learned over the years in confirmation. And we talked about how this message that God has for us is that God says, not only am I going to fix it, but I keep reminding people about the the contract, the promise, right? He promised to Moses. He promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He promised to Joshua. Uh, he promises all the way through all of the prophets. And the promise was is that God was going to provide a Savior. All the way through the Old Testament until Matthew shows up about 600 years after the last prophet. And Matthew, the writing of Matthew shows up and Jesus comes. That's the answer to the promise. Right? So he comes, he lives, he suffers, he dies, he rises again, and then suddenly heaven is opened up to all those that believe. Right? So that message of God's love for us is consistent. That contract. So let's break it down uh, this way. Uh, Ava, would you read that first paragraph on the Old Testament? Ava, sorry. Ava. Underline that, by the way. Go ahead, rock on. These are the books that happened before Jesus was born. They all point to Jesus. The name Old Testament is a little misleading because sometimes we think of old things that are not important to the God's God. Instead, these books can be thought of as the first covenant or promise that God made to his people to send the Savior Jesus. Across the circle to the yeah, across the circle to the left of the cross, write the words of Old Testament, the number thirty nine. Okay, so do that. In that first circle on the left, make sure you get your left and your right. Okay, in the left, put Old Testament and 39 and draw an arrow from that to the cross. It's a good image to imagine this is what it's all about, the Old Testament. Now, it does make this point. The Old Testament is not that it's outdated, right? Sometimes if you say, um, well, I, I think of my cell phone. If you were to show your cell phone maybe to your grandma or grandpa, right? Um, sometimes they don't understand them very well, right? And, and it's because they're older. They didn't grow up with that technology. Now, some grandmas and grandpas are pretty hip, and, and they figure them out, figure out how to use iPads and stuff like that. But sometimes they don't. It's old. So we think sometimes old is less involved. It's, it's not as 
um, uh, known and understood. And so we can look at the Old Testament and go, the Old Testament's not very important because now there's a New Testament, okay? It's like if you had a choice of driving an old car, right, like an old Model T, maybe that would be cool, right, or a new car, you might choose the new car because you're like, it's faster, it's stronger, safer, whatever the case may be. We tend to think old is not so great, new is really better. Okay? That is not the case with the Bible. The Old Testament is not old because it's irrelevant. It's old because it was the first promise. The first promise of God was, I'm going to send a Messiah. Right? That's been the message all the way through the Old Testament. I'm going to send a Messiah. What happens in the very beginning of the New Testament? I just told you. What happens at the very beginning of the New Testament in the Gospels? Anytime I ask a question, the answer is always what? Jesus, right? A lot of times. Jesus comes, right? So he's been promised for thousands of years, about three and a half, you know, 3,500 years. And then finally there in the beginning of the New Testament, Jesus shows up. So he's the answer to the promise. I'm going to send the Messiah. Here he comes. And so now the New Testament, it has a new promise. Still a great promise. Like Eddie said, it still has to do with God's love, but it's changed. God says, I'm going to come and fix this, and he comes and fixes it. But that's not the end, all right? Uh, let's see. Michael, would you read the next paragraph, the New Testament? The New Testament includes, you guessed it, the last 27 books of the Bible. Underline that for me. All right, keep going, you're ready. Would you record Jesus' life and mission or the life of Jesus' early followers All right, get that? Okay, in the circle, New Testament, 27, arrow toward the cross. So what you should have is this idea is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament, right, made up of X number of books, point to Jesus. Everything does, right? I joke about that, that the answer is always Jesus, but when we read through the Bible, it is all about Jesus. Now, let me ask you the obvious question. Why do you think everything in the Bible points to Jesus? Why is that important? Because what? Well, it is, but why? Why is that important? You're exactly right. It is about Jesus, but tell me, why that? Why not about creation? Why not about being good? Right. Why? You're exactly right. You're telling me the truth, but why does it point to Jesus? Because he was the one that did all of that. Did all of what? He made everything. Okay. Okay, so he represents his godness. Okay, that's true. Eddie? Oh, that's what I was looking for, right? The whole point of Jesus coming is to repair what's broken. He saves us. All of those things you guys said are absolutely right. But the point is, is that you want to be saved. You want to be rescued. Our world is broken. I don't have to tell you that. Right? We know that there's aches and pains and there's sickness and there's sadness and there's war and there's starvation and there's pandemics and things like that. We know that things are broken. If somebody said there is a solution and it's not just a solution for the here and now but forever, you'd say that's the most important thing to know. And so the Bible says everything about this points to Jesus. Everything. Right? And so if everything points to Jesus, then everything we read, you think about this way. No matter what you read in the Bible, you should think to yourself, what does this have to do with Jesus? Or what does it have to do with the promise that God gives us? Right? So the promise in the Old Testament is that God is going to send a Messiah. New Testament, the Messiah comes. And then what does the Messiah do? After he ascends back to heaven, what happens next? Jesus goes back to heaven. The disciples are there watching him go up into the sky, if you know the story, right? Angel comes down and says, why are you guys standing around here looking up into the sky? Okay? So what do those guys need to do after Jesus goes back to heaven? What are the apostles and the disciples supposed to do? 
Share what he's done. That's what we're doing, right? To go and be the church. So who do we tell everybody about? Jesus is the answer again all the time, right? So you think about that. So the promise was Jesus is going to come. Then he comes. And then the promise is he's coming back. Right? So that's the second promise. The first promise is, I, I'm going to come, and he does. And then he shows up, and he saves us, and he does everything that he needs to do, that we need him to do. And then we start to spread the good news about Jesus, because one day, he's coming back. So Jesus comes once to save us, and comes back twice to take us home. Right? There's, there's the overview of the Bible, almost just right there. Okay? Um, any questions on that? Number of books and things like that? Everybody have that? Okay, what it's about? Okay, we've got 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Totally, that's how many? 66. 66. It's up at the top if you underline that. Okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about how the Bible is organized. Okay? Uh, let's see. Ben, would you read that section under there? Just read it all. Okay, we're not going to share right now. I think we'll just share in class here as we're gathered together. Um, when you go into a library, um, I would imagine your schools all have a library. You may have been to a public library. Maybe you've been to a bookstore, right? Barnes & Noble or something like that. Um, tell me, how are books organized? Parker? Okay, so sometimes it's alphabetical, right? Based on that. That, that can be one way, right? Uh, give me another one, Ava. Oh, fancy word. Yeah. What's a genre? So there are categories, right? If you were going to look at mysteries, there's a mystery section. If you're going to look at dramas, drama. If there's his, you know, things like that, fiction, nonfiction, comedy, um, things like that, self-help books. They, they put them together by category so that you kind of go, over here is, you know, mysteries. Uh, if, if we did it all by alphabetical order, you could look at a mystery book, a fictional book, a history book, you know, a how-to book, a science book, and it, that can be kind of confusing. Now, if you know the author, maybe you could do it that way. What I tend to do is go into a store and go, I'm looking for this kind of book. And then I start looking at all of the ones that are there, okay? Now, the Bible is actually laid out a lot like that, okay? Um, in libraries, we break them down by genre or genre. Uh, but what we do is we see that they're by divisions and so forth. So, uh, that last paragraph there. Uh, Abby, would you read that, that last paragraph for me? Very good. So let's take a look at that on page seven. Let's look at that. And on the shelf, we've broken down all the books of the Bible, all 66 of them. Okay. And you can see that they're grouped together uh, by certain arrangements. Now, some of them seem to go together. So the Bible itself um, is laid out in a certain way. I, I can tell you it's not a perfect way as far as Genesis was, you know, it is the first book uh, in the Bible, but it's not necessarily the first book historically written. Now, the reason I tell you that is even though the information in Genesis is about the beginning, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, it doesn't get any more in the beginning than that. But Genesis was written by Moses. Moses actually comes along a little later in the story, right? Later on in Exodus. Okay, the end of Genesis, beginning of Exodus. 
Because Exodus is the very name of leaving Egypt. That's what Exodus means. Okay? In fact, they think that Job, if you know that, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, you know where Job is. Um, Job, they think, is probably one of the oldest books written. And yet it's not in the beginning of the Bible, most because it doesn't talk about the beginning of all things. Genesis belongs there. Okay? Now, the last book, Revelation, probably one of the last books written. But the reason it's at the end is because it deals with end times. So I, I want you to see that the books in the Bible aren't necessarily written down like this one's first, this one's second, and was written in those orders. It has to do with genre, right, or genre. Uh, but we'll kind of break that down a little bit now. So um, you're going to jot some things down. It's a little tight there in that, uh, that bookshelf uh, there in your books, but let's just take it this way. The first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are what we call the books of Moses, uh, also known as the Torah or the Torah. It means the law of God. So I want you to write the books of the Torah, right, in that shelf somewhere next to those five books, De Genesis through Deuteronomy. Just write those words, right? Um, books of Moses uh, next to the law books on the right. Uh, they're written all by Moses, okay? That Torah, we also call it, and I want you to write this word in there. It's not in your book. I want you to write the word Pentateuch. I'm going to spell it for you, all right? So next to those five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, write this word, Pentateuch. P-E-N-T-E-P-E-N-T-E-T-E-U-C-H. T-E-U-C-H. I'll spell it again. P-E-N-T-E, -E, Penta, right? And then Tuk, T-E-U-C-H, right? Now, you guys should know this maybe from math class. What does Penta mean? It means five. Right? It means five. Pentagram is a five-sided, right? Uh, five-pointed star. So penta, it means five. Tuk actually refers to writings, right? So five writings of Moses, the Torah, okay? So when a Jew, right, a person who's a practicing Jew, that's somebody who believes in the Old Testament but doesn't believe in the New Testament. They don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. A Jewish person today that's still practicing uh, Judaism, they have a little yarmulke for a guy uh, on top of their heads. They still are waiting for the Messiah, right? And so what they believe is that all the Old Testament is absolutely true. The New Testament, however, is because of Jesus coming, and they said, we don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We're still waiting for it, all right? They're going to be um, they're going to be disappointed. Uh, when Jesus comes back, because it'll be his second time, not his first time. So, um, keep going here. The next books of the Old Testament uh, are called the books of history. These, these tell of the history of God's people from the time of Moses up to the time of Jesus. So count the books of history at the right. Right there, number next to the books. How many are there? Second shelf. Got them? Twelve. There's twelve books, right? Twelve in there. Okay. Okay. And write books of history somewhere next to it. Maybe in the margin. I know it's a little tight in there. There's 12 books of history. So when we read through there, we actually get an understanding of what's been happening with God's chosen people. We call God's chosen people the children of Israel. We call them the Hebrews. Okay? The Hebrews eventually are called the Jews. So that's the same group of people. You know, generations separated, but that's who they are. Um, Ava, you were talking about Joshua is one of your favorites, right? So Joshua is one of those history books. Tells about the people. Tells about their journey through uh, the wilderness. Tells about when they finally enter into the promised land. It tells about the many kings that they have. One of the things I'm going to mention in my sermon on Sunday uh, is that there are roughly 30 kings uh, that were kings over Israel, right? They... they wanted kings and so they had 30 different kings one after the other and uh god says in the bible he says out of those 30 kings there were eight good ones right eight good kings that means there were 22 bad kings um i think about that sometimes uh as a person here in america and understand that uh, not every president that we have we don't have kings but not every president we have is going to be a great president we're going to have some bad presidents just like the children of israel had some bad kings those bad kings tend to teach us something, right? They sometimes teach us a greater dependence on God. 
And then we celebrate when there's good kings or good presidents, right? That's not my commentary on our current president or any past president. Just a simple fact of life of how we approach uh, this relationship with the leaders around us. All right, so the next one. Next are the books of wisdom and poetry. Count the number. Write it in there. What do you get for a number? All right, five of them there. There's that Song of Solomon, Ada, you mentioned. And uh, you got Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Uh, that was one. I think, Ada, you said that one too. Uh, there's great examples of that in poetry. And uh, that's one of the reasons when you guys, if you ever open a Bible. Um, in fact, why don't you do that right now? Grab a Bible in front of you. Uh, open it up somewhere. Somewhere, anywhere at all. Just crack it open. My guess is it looks pretty much like paragraphs. Okay? Unless, of course, you've opened up to the middle, which is probably Psalms or Proverbs or something, and you'll notice it's written differently. You'll notice the typesetting is all centered and it's staggered in and out, and that's because the Psalms were things that they actually sang. Now, I know the songs that you guys like and the songs that I like, um, I can't sing the Psalms. Right? They don't rhyme at the end. A lot of our songs rhyme. Uh, that's one of the things we like about songs. And uh, a lot of our poetry rhymes. I know there's some kind of weird poetry. Sometimes it doesn't rhyme. If you guys ever written a haiku in class, right? or maybe in creative writing or things like that, does it rhyme? Okay? But a lot of times the, the limericks, the poetry, we rhyme. It's simpler. It's just kind of our culture. So if you ever, by the way, crack open a Bible in the middle, you're most likely in Psalms. Most of, most of the middle of the Bible is going to be the Psalms. Um, but not perfectly, but pretty close. Uh, it's always a good kind of benchmark for you. All right, so uh, write the books of wisdom uh, and poetry uh, next to those books, next to those five books. Then comes a great big list, right? The last group in the Old Testament is called the books of prophecy. Count those up. How many are there? 17 books. That's a lot of prophecy. Right? Uh, so write that down there as well. Just simply write the word prophets next to them. Now there are some what we call major prophets and there are minor prophets. It really has to do with the size uh, of the book and also the number of messages they have. Um, now can you guys tell me what prophets do? What do they do? Do what? Share the word of God. Yeah. Now, what a lot of times people think is prophets tell the future. That they have this God-given ability to foresee the future. They have the gift or they have the responsibility to tell people what God tells them to say. Sometimes it's about the future, but it's not something they necessarily kind of say, all right, here's next week's lottery numbers. Okay. They don't have that ability. Okay. Not unless God gives it to them. What they do is say, God says, go and tell my people this. Right? So like if, if um, for instance, if you have a brother or sister at home and your parents say, go and tell your sister, or go and tell your brother this. Okay? In a way, you're a prophet. Not really that important in your family, but the idea is the same. Right? Go and tell them this. Okay? And so you got Isaiah, Jeremiah, those are some of our major prophets. But then you got some little ones. I think maybe you said Haggai. Right? That's one of those. It's a minor prophet, as you see that in there. Okay, so now that's the Old Testament. So, four different genres. Okay, you've got the books of Moses, the books of history, uh, poetry and wisdom, and then prophecy. So, if we break down the Old Testament, those four categories. All right, so then we've got the New Testament. Um, the New Testament. Let's just read some of these. Uh, let's see. Will, would you read that paragraph, the New Testament? Perspectives. These make up the heart of the Bible. Write gospels next to these books in the show. Alright, write the word gospels, put a heart around them. Okay? Draw a heart around it. It's the heart of the message. Remember, what are both testaments all about? What do they point to? Jesus. Where does he show up in the Bible? In the Gospels. So there's the heart of the, the, the scriptures is the four gospels. Some people have asked me before, uh, they, they've wondered, why are there four Gospels? Why not just one? 
Right? It's a, it's a message about Jesus. It's his life, his miracles, his teaching. Why do we have four Gospels? I want you to imagine this. You guys think in your mind about a diamond. Okay? Diamond is a rare stone. It's cut special. It's very geometrical. In fact, it has all these flat sides called facets. Right? And that's what makes gems really pretty. Light goes through it. It's like a prism. You guys have seen like prisms, sun prisms. The sun comes in, makes a rainbow and so forth. Imagine that the life of Jesus is that diamond. And you can look at that diamond from different angles. And every one is beautiful. And it's different, but it's still a diamond. So you can look at Jesus' life through Matthew, through Mark, through Luke, through John. And that's why there's more than one gospel. You get a different picture of Jesus, right? I was telling Eddie, the one thing I love about John, the gospel of John, it talks more about love than any other gospel. It, it's true. Luke, I love about Luke, Luke is a doctor, Right before he was a disciple, he was a doctor. One of the cool things about Luke is that when Jesus comes upon one of the great examples in Matthew, it says they came to a man in a town with a withered hand. It means his hand was all crunched up and so forth and didn't work anymore. Okay, That's the story in Matthew. A man had a withered hand and Jesus healed it, restored it to being whole. In Luke, it says Jesus came upon a man with palsy. He diagnosed his condition, right? Because Luke is a doctor and he goes, I know what that is. That's palsy. Matthew is a tax collector. He goes, I don't know, is one hand smaller than the other one? That's all I know. Because he's not a doctor, right? So you see their own personalities kind of coming out, but you see something different about Jesus in each of them. So it's one of those great things. Okay, uh, let's see. Ada, would you read the next paragraph? Next. Okay, right next to Acts, right? The Acts of the Apostles, right? History. Okay? Now, when I was asking you what happened next after Jesus ascended to heaven, the early church begins, right? There wasn't really a church at the time of Jesus. He had followers, right? In the early um, times of his, his ministry, they called them the followers of the way. In fact, they were called Christians, and you know that that word is Christ. They were Christians. After Jesus ascended back to heaven, they started kind of calling themselves, we are followers of Christ, or followers of the way. All right? Uh, let's see. Parker, next paragraph. The next books. Next books are called the... Pauline Epistles. All right, so if you count them up, how many are there? Thirteen. Thirteen letters from Paul. So Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. When you think of those bottom three shelves, that middle shelf is all Paul. Right? And so Paul, if you remember, it, you guys know the story of Paul? What was his name before God got a hold of him? He was Saul, and he was persecuting the church. He was the exact opposite of a disciple. God got a hold of him, blinded him. Right? And, and taught him a lesson in a sense, right? Dependence on him. And says, now your name's going to be Paul. And now Paul is this phenomenal missionary. He suffered a lot. Uh, and then he writes these letters. Now those letters were written to churches. So somebody mentioned one of the books, Ephesians, right? Ephesians are the name of the people who lived in Ephesus, right? Um, ben, you mentioned Thessalonians. Those were people that lived in Thessalonica. Okay? And so as he wrote letters, I don't know what we are here in Jefferson City. What do they call us? Jefferson Cityans? Why not? All right? That sounds good as anything. So if Paul was alive today and writing to our church, it would be First Jefferson Cityans. All right? That'd be the name of the letter. But he wrote to all these churches, young churches, just getting started. And so that's one of the beautiful things about what Paul did. Okay? Um, let's tie a bow on this. Eddie, would you read that last bottom one there near the end? It starts with near the end. All right, so write the words general epistles just to the right of those 
uh, books. You can see there are how many? Eight. Eight. Eight of them there. Don't include Revelation. Revelation is separate, right? Even though it's on that bottom shelf, there's a separation between it. Okay? So these are the, what we call the general epistles. They were written by different people, different church leaders, right? Um, first and second Peter, written by Peter, the uh, disciple. First, second, third John, written by John. Um, Jude. James, you see that little short purple one? That James is actually the brother of Jesus. We don't think of that many times that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but he did. And so James, there in that book, uh, that's actually Jesus' brother. So, you know, imagine this. Jesus' mom is Mary, okay? But he was conceived miraculously, not with Joseph, okay? Just miraculously with God. And so, so he's born, and then obviously after that, Mary and Joseph have other kids. And so those other kids are Jesus' brothers and sisters. We don't get a long list of them. They did come and visit him one time and tried to pull him away from a crowd when he was teaching because they are like, you're causing all this trouble. Stop causing trouble. He says, your mom and your family are outside, talking about his brothers and sisters. But James is his actual brother. I think that's one of the reasons that James is one of the more blunt books in the Bible. He says things in a very blunt way because I think his experience growing up with Jesus. Because imagine this. Could you imagine having Jesus as your brother? Right? How many times would your mother say, why can't you be more like Jesus? Right? Why don't you pay attention like Jesus does? Why don't you go to bed when we tell you like Jesus does? Okay? But the point was is he saw Jesus for who he was. Right? So it truly is. And so I think naturally there was this sense of once Jesus died and rose and went back to heaven, James was like, my brother was Jesus, and, and we got to let other people know this, right? This is hugely important. And so he just tend to be a little bit more aggressive, a little more blunt uh, in his approach. Last one, Mike, would you read that last paragraph for me? The final book of the, of the Bible is the only book of prophecy in the New Testament. The book of Yeah, maybe put that out in the margin where there's room. Just put prophecy out there. Revelation is a fascinating book to read uh, and study. A lot of times it's, there's a lot of symbolism, isn't there? really is. Seven-headed dragons and crowns and, and, and angels and thrones and so forth. But it is a picture of what the Apostle John, right? He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the Revelation. God gave him, gave him the Revelation. Revelation is an awareness um, a vision, a picture of what things are. And so he told them to write them down. And so um, all the other disciples, by the way, were killed for their faith in Jesus. They were martyred, we call it, right? Except for John. John was banished and uh, went to the island of Crete, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, where he would die of old age. So he was old enough to see and experience and write down the revelation. All the other disciples died shortly after um, you know, the, the early church began. They, they weren't around for very long uh, because Rome wanted to squash this movement called the Way and Christians and so forth. All right, any questions on that? Everybody get it down? One more page, flip over to page eight. Page eight, all right, I know there was a whole lot of information. Uh, don't panic. Uh, we'll spend some more time going over these details a little bit more in the future, but let's reflect for a second. What is one interesting thing that you've learned so far about the Bible? Jot it down there. One interesting thing that you've learned about the Bible tonight. I hope there was something. Right? Something interesting that you learned about the Bible tonight. Just jot it down there. And the next one, what's something interesting maybe you've learned more specifically about the Old Testament? Maybe there's something I said. Maybe there's something you read that was like, well, that was interesting about the Old Testament. Maybe it's what testament means. Maybe what old is talking about. Maybe what's in it. Maybe who wrote some. Well, just something that stuck out in you, obviously, in the last 30, 40 minutes. Tell me something you came up with. And then the last one there is something interesting about the New Testament. Share something that's interesting about the New Testament. Take a minute to write it down. Okay, everybody get a chance to at least note something there. 
Now, I want to just touch on something as you guys are wrapping that up. Um, all of you are in probably different places when it comes to your knowledge, your understanding of the Bible and things. So I want to just make sure I'm clear about a couple of things. Take some time, uh, maybe this week, and look over that orange box there that says one last thing. And it breaks down kind of how do we use the numbering and the arrangement, the structure of the Bible. Like if I say, if you were to look up John 3, 16, do you understand what those numbers are for? And that'll help you kind of walk you through that. We don't have to take the time tonight to do it necessarily, but the books are lined up, you know, and, and broken down by their arrangement, by their genre. And then they're broken down smaller into chapters. And then those chapters are broken down smaller into verses. And those verses, by the way, um, I don't want to upset you guys from what you think may have happened. Um, these weren't put in there by the writers. These numbers and things were added on later on by us, uh, mostly when we were more Greek uh, arranged because we liked order. So we put numbers and chapters and things like that. As a pastor, uh, we have to learn the original language of the Old Testament and the original language of the New Testament. That's Hebrew and Greek. So I had to learn a couple languages uh, to be a pastor. And what you find out is that there's no numbering in Hebrews or Greek. There's just kind of breaks where you take a breath. And that's usually where they put a number. And it helps us to be able to look for things. So instead of saying, you know that verse in John that says, for God so loved the world, and you're trying to remember all 16 chapters of John or whatever, instead you kind of go, John 3, okay, so I go 1, 2, 3, find that, and verse 16, go down until you find 14, 15, 16, there it is. That's why we number them. It's just more structure for us. So last thing, and then we'll wrap it up for tonight. There's two great teachings in the Bible. We talked about the Old New Testament. Those aren't teachings. Those are structures. Those are areas. So throughout the Bible overview, you will need a lot about, you'll read a lot about the law and the gospel. These are the two central doctrines or teachings of the Bible. As you receive the word of God, the Holy Spirit works both law and gospel in you. So it's something that has an effect on you. All right? Underline that for me. All right? The Holy Spirit works both law and gospel in you. Underline that. It's not just about knowing what's law and what's gospel. It's about understanding how God uses both to create faith and eternal life in you. One way to remember that is this device, SOS. So the law is SOS, shows our sin, SOS. The gospel shows our Savior, SOS, both of them. Okay. So I want you to think of different ways the words of the Bible show us our sin and then show us our Savior, Jesus. So think of the ways that the law shows us our sin. Can anybody think of the way that the law shows us our sin? Chase? It tells us how perfect God is, which makes us reflect on how bad we are. Excellent, right? Uh, let me give you a simple word for that. Comparing to God. Right? Nice and easy, right? We compare ourselves to God. God is holy. He's perfect. And then we realize we're not. In fact, I often say that in church, right, before we confess our sins. Right, right after we've said the Apostles' Creed, I said, now that we've seen this, we recognize that we ourselves are sinful. Right? And when you realize that, you're like, I'm in trouble. That's SOS. Shows me uh, my sin. Shows our sin. So how does the gospel show our Savior? How does the gospel show our Savior? What do you think? Maybe? Say again? Yeah, because it talks about our for, His forgiveness to us. Yeah, so it talks about forgiveness. You and I are, are without hope, without forgiveness. Otherwise, you've got to think about how do I erase my sin? How can I be so good that God will just ignore my sin? We can't be. Instead, we recognize that it's only through God's grace can we do that. All right, guys, we have reached our hour. Um, for those of you that are watching online, take a look right here at the bottom of the video. You'll have a short little assignment that I'm going to ask of you. Uh, but for you guys tonight, let's uh, close our books. Let's have a little word of prayer, and uh, we'll send you guys on your way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you uh, for your goodness, your mercy. Uh, Lord, and your love for us. I thank you for uh, these minds that are around me tonight. I thank you what you, you do in them, what you intend to do. Uh, Lord, I celebrate in anticipation. Uh,